All right, let's get the obvious out of the way. Yes, with the ceramic bezel, this looks a little bit like a Daytona. Now, can we talk about the watch? Hi everyone and welcome to Chaluso and yes today we are talking about the Zenith Chronomaster Sport. This is a watch that I've really been keen to get my hands on over the last year and a bit since it was released but just haven't had the opportunity until now and that is of course a big thanks to Chronext who lent me this watch so that I could film it. If you want to check out their full selection of Zenith watches including some of the vintage pieces that I'll be featuring throughout this video make sure you check their links in the description below and use the promo code CHALUSO if you want to buy one of those or any other watch from their selection. But let's get started in talking about the Chronomaster Sport and like in most of my videos I do like to look a little bit at the history of the watches and in this case let's take a look at the lineage that led us to where we're at now. So the Chronomaster Sport owes its existence down to really three model lines. You have the Deluca and the Rainbow from the 1990s, as well as the Chronomaster line from most of the 2000s, which in itself pays homage to the 1969 Zenith A386. Now the Deluca and the Rainbow, there were plenty of variations on them. Some of them had steel tachymeter bezels, others had rotating bezels, some had screw down pushers, and those all sort of converged in the end to more rotating bezels and what ended up evolving into the Stratos. The Chronomaster meanwhile, and what we now know as the Chronomaster original, are both derivatives of the original A386, which was released in 1969, as the more regular shaped one compared to something like the A385, which had a more distinctive shape. And all three of these lines kind of converge when you see the Chronomaster Sport. Definitely the sizing and the premise of being a sportier watch, you can definitely see a lot of DNA from the Deluca, the Rainbow, eventually the Stratos, in the fact that it's 100 meters water resistance, it's a 41 millimeter case, 13.6 millimeters thick, so not particularly thick, but not also particularly thin either. The general premise of having, of course, that bezel, in this case, it's now black and ceramic. All of that, you can trace it to the original Deluca and Rainbows from the 1990s. Meanwhile, the case shape itself and that dial, especially with the tricolor registers, is pure A386, pure Chronomaster. The shape on the Chronomaster Sport is actually very similar to the Chronomaster El Primero that I tested last year. And it has a really, really distinctive shape, especially when you look at the lugs and how they're sort of cut off at the ends versus something that's more flowy, like for example, a Speedmaster. In general, the overall package is definitely good looking. When you have that black bezel and the black dial, A, I think it looks a lot more sinister compared to the white dial version, which is maybe a little bit friendlier. But also I feel like the colored registers, for some reason, they do sort of get set off a little bit more with the black dial compared to the white dial. You can see the different shades of gray and the shade of blue. You can see the little ticks of red as well. Everything all stands out a little bit more in my opinion compared to the white dial. But at the end of the day, this is a Zenith. It's not just about the design, it's about the movement. And of course, being a Zenith, the movement is an El Primero, but not the El Primero that we've become accustomed to. This is the Caliber 3600, and you can tell this is something a little different from the moment that you turn it on. That central hand is no longer indicating seconds, instead it's indicating tenths of a second, and that's what you read on the outer bezel. Something that's much more useful than a tachymeter, which for the most part, even though I've read about it three or four times already, every time I try to read a tachymeter, for example on my chronomat, I find myself reaching to my phone to figure out how it works again. Whereas the tenth of a second is much more understandable and also much more usable if you're timing something. Being a Formula One fan, for me, what matters much more is tenths of a second, not trying to figure out the speed of it over time. It's just a little bit too complicated for me. I'd rather just know what the lap time is. I do have to say that before I tested this watch, I did find that central hand to be quite stressy and maybe something that would make you think like that your watch isn't working or your watch has gone a bit haywire. I do have to say you actually get used to it. While I was filming it, I actually had the chronograph running for most of the shoot, so I became very accustomed to seeing it, seeing it move so fast. And again, knowing the context, there's an actual use to it. I love that they've managed to properly repurpose that 36,000 vibrations per hour that they have on the El Primero, because yes, it's true. It is a great way to make sure that you reduce your tendency for beat error. 
It is also something that creates a smoother sweep, but they've created a much more functional use for it. And that I think is something really, really cool in how they've been able to evolve what is, of course, Zenith's signature caliber. Arguably, the El Primero is a bigger brand than any of their individual model lines. Additional changes with the 3600, well, because now you have the central hand doing duty as your one tenth of a second hand, you now have three different registers to your running seconds. You also have your general chronograph seconds register, which has now been moved onto a sub register. And you have a minutes register, which has been increased to 60 minutes instead of 30 minutes, which is what you normally would see on the El Primero 400. I think that's a nice compromise considering they've gotten rid of the hours register. And one last little eccentricity to this watch. Yes, it does have hacking seconds, which is something the El Primero 400 didn't have before, but they've also fixed the eccentric settings of the 400 in that now the first position is your date change. And now if you pull it all the way out, that not only hacks the seconds, but also that's your time setting. On a regular 400, the second position is the date change, the first position is the time setting. And overall, I think all of these things come together to make a really, really good watch. You know, I think aesthetically, it, they've definitely knocked it out of the park, especially with the black dial, like I said before, it really makes those subdials pop. The subdials and the colors make it a little bit more playful at the same time. The black bezel and the black dial make it look a little bit more sinister, a little bit more badass maybe than the white dial version. I love the way that they've managed to really bring out the most from the El Primero movement in this evolution to the 3600. And I also love the way that they've really modernized this watch while not letting it lose its classical characteristics. I mean, as mentioned before, you can see the DNA from the three different collections that contributed to its existence throughout everything. It's a nice mesh of modern and classical. Even when you look on the back, you can see how they modernized the El Primero movement, not just in terms of the tech specs, but also in terms of the finishing. It's got that sort of darker gray hue to it. It looks like a much more modern movement, but without losing any of the DNA of the original Caliber 400, which has been around since 1969. But of course, not everything is all sunshine and rainbows. This watch does have a few negatives as well. The bracelet itself, I do prefer their previous iteration of a bracelet on the Chronomaster. This one, I think it's gotten a little bit rounder, a little bit too much like an oyster, whereas on the previous pre-caliber 3600 Chronomasters, the links had a much flatter profile. They were also sunk into each other versus being properly separated. And crucially, they had a butterfly clasp instead of this god-awful fold-over clasp thing that they have going on which clearly is aping Rolex. There's no other way to describe it. This is the epitome of a knockoff when you compare it to the Rolex clasp. It looks like the Rolex clasp, but the quality is nowhere near there. It had a lot of sharp edges. It was very clunky. And also if you have that big a clasp, why would you not make an easy micro adjust instead of having the much more antiquated divots where yeah, you have to use a tool to adjust it. It was a wasted opportunity. I think they could have easily stuck with the previous gen clasp and bracelet. Those were much better in my opinion, much more distinctive. Or as I said last year, when they initially released this watch, they should have just repurposed the Defy bracelet. I think that would have been much more distinctive, would have gotten rid of at least half of the comparisons to the Daytona and just a much better product overall. But I'm not the one who's running Zenith Design, so maybe they know something I don't. But you get rid of that bracelet and you have an amazing watch. Arguably, I actually prefer it as a non-bracelet option. Having a 20 millimeter lug width means you have tons of options for different straps. I would love to see this on, for example, a full rubber strap, maybe even one of Artem's sailcloth straps. The one that they provide with the non-bracelet version does already have a little bit of that feel. It's got like sort of a ballistic nylon type of look to it. I think it just sets the watch apart a lot more. And I think when you factor out the bracelet, those comparisons to the Daytona are much less apparent because really it lets the case do a lot more of the talking and the case is very different to what you would see on a Daytona. So definitely in my view, still overall a great move from Zenith. And at the end of the day, I remember last year when this watch came out, it got so much attention. When you look at the prices of these watches, you can see that it's also much more stable in terms of its pricing compared to previous generation Chronomasters. The pricing for this at retail is about 10,000 euros on the pre-owned market. It goes for about 8,000 up to 12,000 euros. So that does tell you that definitely the market does believe in this watch. And there are some people who are even managing to sell these for over retail. I think a lot of it depends on your region and how available it is at retail versus if you have to wait for it. But when you consider it, really what other competition does it have that offers this level of technical sophistication and advancement with plenty of wearability and with so much history behind it? One of the reasons why I've been able to avoid talking about the Daytona for this whole video is because honestly, this is a watch that 
has plenty to talk about on its own. It has its own merits, it has its own history. This isn't just some random micro brand that sprung up with Kickstarter and made a watch that looked like a Daytona. And need I remind you, its mechanics and forebears were integral to the success of the Daytona today. So I think this has every right to stand on its own and to be compared favorably to a Daytona, as well as to any other competitors that it has within its segment. Things like the Navitimer and the Moonwatch, while yes, currently at retail more affordable than the Chronomaster Sport, they don't necessarily push the envelope in the same way as it. In my view though, all of them and the Daytona share relatively equal footing in terms of their significance to the watch industry. And so in my view, that just adds to what's special about the Chronomaster is that it is one of those iconic watches that maybe doesn't get the respect it deserves, but it definitely merits its position in the company it keeps. But let me know in the comments below, what do you think of the Chronomaster Sport? Do you think that it sets itself apart and has its own merits enough to justify it looking a little bit like a Daytona? Or do you think that this was just a marketing exercise that Zenith actually got quite right? Because again, it did get quite a fair bit of attention when it was released and it is selling quite well for them. Love to know you guys' thoughts in the comments below. And of course, if you like this video, make sure you like it and share it. If you want to see more pictures and infographics of watches as seen throughout this and all my other videos, make sure you follow me on Instagram at Shaluso. If you want to see more videos of watches, then make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell as well so you know when the next video comes out. In any case, thanks for watching this video and we'll catch you in the next one.